Um, uh-huh. All right, good good to be here. I'm uh, see some of y'all from back in October when we did a, a little Zoom then. And this one is going to have a little homework to it. Uh, so here we go. So I'm Rob Hawk and the County Extension Director in Jackson and Swain County in far western North Carolina, uh, to give you a little geographic, uh, near Cherokee Reservation, uh, towns of Bryson City and Silva. So I'm also uh, do community development uh, much like some of yourselves in, in natural resource management. And then on uh, part of the job, I'm the uh, co-state coordinator for the Leopold Education Project for North Carolina, which is a national program uh, from the Aldo Leopold Foundation out of Baraboo in Wisconsin, where Aldo Leopold had a farm that he restored in the Sand County region during the 1930s, uh, it was kind of his outdoor lab as far as ecosystem management. So let's see here. Um, I'm gonna start sharing a screen. And hold on just a second. Can everyone see that? Yes. Very good. Okay. So what I'm going to take this um, activity, there's a couple activities that Aldo Leopold Foundation manages. Uh, one's the Leopold Education Project, which is a curriculum-based uh, for teachers uh, to teach primarily youth fifth to 12th grade. And it's uh, based on this book that you see on the screen there, A Sand County Almanac uh, by Aldo Leopold that was published in the 1940s. And then it has some other uh, curriculum based Leopold education project. But about 10 years ago, they started another activity that you could use in the community to start uh, critical conversations, some of them um, contentious. Uh, and there's an activity that we're gonna go through this evening called the Land Ethics Leaders, which you can go to a two day training and they offer it usually twice a year. Of course, it didn't happen last year and it may not happen this year, usually spring and August, um, maybe even in the fall too, but it's a two day program. It's really good and I'd encourage you to go to it and you just have to go to the Aldo Leopold Foundation website and you can um, click on Land Ethics Leaders to see when they're offering that. So I took the course about 10 years ago. It was a couple of days. And what I'm gonna share with you is a little bit of that uh, exercise that I was trained in. So can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. All right, thanks Phil. So the Land Ethics Leaders, and let's see here. Play from start. Okay. Um, we're going to use the Sand County Almanac a little bit this evening, and it's going to be relevant and time, timely uh, based on his, one of his essays in January. Okay. So there is the Aldo Leopold shack and farm. That was where Aldo Leopold. Uh, restored an old depression era farm when he was a professor uh, about 35 miles south of there in Madison, the University of Madison or University of Wisconsin in Madison. And his family just loved that place. And he planted, I think, close to 50, 48, 50,000 white pines and they, to stop the erosion and, and give it a wildlife habitat. And he, uh, also unfortunately perished on that farm fighting a, uh, a wildfire that got out of control from a, an adjacent farmer. So that's in Baraboo, Wisconsin. You can look up on the Atlas. It's in a glaciated area called the Baraboo Range, uh, the South Range and the North Range, really pretty area. So what, what are we talking about here? So what is Land Ethics Leaders? Um, it's a two-day land ethic leaders program. It equips participants like yourself to connect, to connect 
wider audiences to Leopold's land ethic. So that was, he kind of had the term land ethic and the uh, philosophy behind that. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that this evening, which helps uh, them, you as a participant, deep, deepen your understanding of this idea through dialogue about the meaning and value of conservation. This is something that you can use in your county when there's contentious issues uh, about conservation, or environmental issues, environmental uh, degradation, uh, land growth, that type of thing. And there's the website, uh, aldoleopold.org. This program is based on Leopold's uh, philosophy of how you develop a land ethic and everybody's at a different uh, place in the game of, of their own land ethic. And you take observation, participation and reflection. Okay, framework is based on Leopold's own method of building a land ethic with his family and students. He did this with his uh, family. Um, he had three daughters and a son and also his students in, in wildlife biology there at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And this that is basically participants explore the land ethic by observing the outdoors participating in an environmental service project, which you're gonna do in your community, uh, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, discussing important conservation issues and reflecting both on their learning and the training and what they feel called to do next. Participants come away with new relationships. And that's what really conservation boils down to. If you watch the green fire, uh, documentary, you'll find out conservation. Uh, one rancher in New Mexico where Leopold worked uh, read the San Kenny Almanac. And he says, you know, I really thought it was about the land. It's it really about relationships, which we know that as extension people and master gardeners and clients of extension. And it gives you tools, ideas, and facilitation skills for developing and articulating their own land ethic bringing their values and ideas into action, inspiring others back home to do the same. Well, it should be capitalized, my apology there. I'll have a chance to co-lead discussions. And in, plan and in planning and leading yours, you will build on listening and facilitation skills, which are critical components to leadership of any kind. Okay, so what I'm sharing with you tonight is something that you can do uh, in your community, regardless whether you go to the two-day training or not, but I'm going to give you a sample of it of this evening. If you have any questions, just uh, throw up a chat or just uh, say hey there on the audio. Um, so benefits. What are the benefits of developing land tech leaders in your community? Uh, this is this is the reason uh, the Aldo Leopold Foundation exists, so they can instill and and help generations uh, to to develop a land ethic of their own. Okay, so <clears throat> the benefit is by taking part in these discussions about the big questions we all share in our quest to to live our values. We've collectively we collectively explore the challenges and opportunities to developing and building an environmental ethic. Discussions are designed to help you come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of your own views, as well as those that differ. A critical skill for engaging your community back home. These discussions should be around clarity, commitment, and community connection. So, the observe, participate, and reflect model provides a framework to help you think about your approach to any challenge in a new and open way. The Land Ethics Leader Program will recharge you by building clarity, commitment, and community around environmental values to help you carry forward in your work. Okay, that could be farmland preservation. That could be um, <clears throat> you get a lot of uh, contentious issues about building greenways or rails to trails, that type of thing in communities you know, uh, not in my backyard, and uh, those type of things. And, and there, especially in the coal fields of East Kentucky and Southwest Virginia, there's a lot of uh, uh, issues that are environmentally related. This will make sense in a minute. So I, I, I when I uh, teach people this and the way I was taught, I use poetry and art. Okay, and I kind of 
uh, poetry is art and, and art is poetry in, in a sense. So when you get people around a table in a community to talk about something, it's maybe best not to just throw out a question of an issue, but to get them to start to build relationships. So you put the elephant in the middle of the room. So I'm gonna put the, instead of elephant, I'm gonna put this picture in the middle of our screen here. And I would like some discussion on what we see here or what you see as an individual. Told you it's going to be time time sensitive and relative to the to the season. Any thoughts? Anybody out there? Well, this is Gina, and I see a, a beautiful, idyllic scene there. I mean, I love it. I'd like to be there with, whether that's a man or a woman in that little sleigh, I'd love to be there. Right, exactly. It's definitely cold. I'll say cold. Okay. I like the birches. Yeah, that, that stuck out to me too, Chad. Really did. It looks very lonely, uh, like there's plenty of solitude and peacefulness. Okay. Thanks, Margaret. You're welcome. Margaret or Mary, I can't tell. <laughs> um, Margaret, I don't know why Mary's on there too, but because we just participated in that one time together. Okay. Paint. <laughs> yeah, and there's definitely no wrong answer here, and, and y'all are definitely doing good observations. Uh, I can I can resonate and relate with what uh, Shad's saying about the birches because birches are one of my favorite trees. So that's something that we can relate and, um, and have some common ground on, okay? It's definitely, um, it is a lonely thing. This is something you probably would not see today. You might see a horseback rider, but a sleigh, probably not uh, unless you're in somewhere besides the Southern Appalachians for sure, but not even maybe in New England. So I always use, you know, this is kind of instead of um, instead of focusing on, say, uh, uh, an issue, presenting the problem to a group in, in the, your community, get them to focus on this and get them to talk about this. This is what we're going to talk about. We're going to start finding out some of our um, values and some of our values are the same. OK. It's not this or that, but it, it's, it, it, it's this is what we're focused on, if that makes sense. So this, this picture, this painting goes with uh, this poem. And I'm sure y'all all know this poem by Robert Frost, right? Stopping by the woods on a snowy evening. Right. Okay, so I'm going to read this. So whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. So <clears throat> as a facilitator of a land ethics leaders activity, I'm gonna start asking questions. What is going on here? What is being portrayed by Robert Frost in this poem? He's trespassing on private property. <laughs> You're right, Shad, he is. 
He is because he knows the land belongs to someone in the village and they don't won't see him, right? That's right. He will not see me stopping here. <laughs> yeah, right. Especially he's probably not going to be out on his <clears throat> his land on a on a snowy stormy night. But do, do you think does he sound like he feels threatened? That is he worried that he's going to get in trouble for trespassing? No, no, I don't think so. What else is what else is going on here? Well, I don't think it's quite the idyllic scene that I noticed from the painting because obviously this person has somewhere important to go. So it's not as idyllic as I first thought. Mm hmm. Where's he going? That's the $64,000 question, but obviously it's pretty important. He has promises to keep and miles to go before he gets any rest. Mm hmm True. I was going to make the observation that even though he had things to do, he obviously had the sense to take the time out to appreciate the situation uh, where he was. And uh, he, he didn't let the, the destination get in the way of the journey. Exactly. Hold on just a minute. I, I got to get something here for this. I've got to step away from the desk just a second. Hold on. Hello. Hey, I'm back. Sorry about that, y'all. So, um, what values do you think this, uh, what values is Robert Frost portraying here? I think he's portraying someone that, that puts a lot of value in keeping a promise and uh, he's willing to keep a promise, even though it's obvious he would love to tarry and, and stay in that wintry scene as long as possible. Exactly. Have you ever had, let me ask you this, have you ever had an experience similar to this? I was out deer hunting one time on a friend's property near Lexington and um, the, it, it started off warm that day, but it turned to rain and then finally snow. And um, I didn't really have good clothing on, but I got up under a, a cedar tree to stay out of the snow and the deer weren't moving because the front was coming through, but I just sat there watching the snow accumulate until it got to be like six or seven inches deep. And um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. At the time I was a little miserable, but looking back on it now, um, it was a vivid memory. So uh, um, that's the closest thing I've come to this. Chad, do, do you... Um... Do you think that experience deepened your uh, 
your land ethic? I mean, it sounds like you already had a land ethic because you're a hunter, but did it enrich it? Did it, did it, what, give me, tell me more. Oh, I sat there and I, the only thing I remember seeing that day was a, 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 a great blue heron flew to a farm pond that I was watching. And I can remember it uh, catching a fish and it raised its head straight up and swallowed the fish. And I could watch the lump of the fish going down its throat through my binoculars. And uh, so I, I guess the appreciation it gave me was uh, to just be still and to watch what's going on around you. And uh, just because there's a little discomfort involved, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not a, a great uh, experience. And it kind of, uh, I was young at the time. And uh, I think that was the first time I had really been out in a situation that um, could have gone bad. But uh, to just learn to uh, observe uh, natural shelters and um, not to panic. Uh, so that, that's kind of what it taught me. Uh, I appreciate cedar trees after that. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> cedar trees are definitely helpful in, in stormy situations like that. Like uh, hemlock used to be, but of course, we've lost our hemlock. Anybody else want to share an experience that maybe uh, deepened or enriched your um, land ethic or environmental ethic? I have a kind of a vivid uh, experience like Chad. Uh, one day I was out cruising timber and it was a pretty cool day and uh, I was not miserable miserable but I was cold and I, I came across a southern slope and uh, kind of protected from the wind and uh, I just laid down on the ground and soaked it in and, and the, the sun was hitting me just right and warmed me up and I just uh, laid there a while and really enjoyed that and for some reason well I guess the reason is obvious but but that moment or that time has always stuck with me as, as something that I drew a lot of pleasure from. Mm -hmm. Right. It's amazing if you just stop and, and look around and get down on the ground. Sometimes you see a lot of things uh, happening down there that uh, you miss if you just uh, trudge on through and, and don't pay a lot of mind to what's around you. Right. Could this experience have been, well, it's pretty profound, but it could, uh, this type of experience can't be found in, in um, home, in shelter, right? Right. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Okay. It was, a, it was just a, a moment where, I don't know, I felt like I was really the only person in the whole world. It was, I was just out there by myself and mm -hmm. enjoying God's creation and uh, just, just really, really enjoying it. Right. So I don't know if y'all have noticed, if, if this has been the case where you have been in this past year, but every recreation site that I've been to, even just this past weekend in the North Georgia mountains or in the Smokies here in the summer, fall, back in the spring, that the outdoors were absolutely so crowded because there just wasn't enough recreation sites for everybody that's trying to get outside. Some were closed down, so that put pressure on others. Did y'all have that where you lived? I've never seen anything like it uh, or experienced it. It just became like the city came to the woods. Robert, we had people that came down um, from New York and places where they closed their parks during the, the pandemic. So they actively sought out places that were still open. 
And, um, you know, normally I would have been miffed at that, that, you know, that they were bringing their potential problem down to us. But I just couldn't feel that way because I understood why they were so desperate to get outside. Uh, because that's the truest uh, form of freedom uh, that we could have. Oh, good point. Good point, Chad. Yeah. They want, that's right. They say get outside and then places were closed. <laughs> mm -hmm. I couldn't get to the National Park here five miles from home because six miles from home because it was closed for a month, two months, eight weeks. It was shut down. Rob, one of the things that uh, that I heard was several several people had mentioned in the area that that parks had more trash in them, uh, that people had left trash behind on, on hiking trails and that sort of thing uh, that they had never seen before uh, because of an uptick in people who maybe were not used to using those trails. Um, um, so it could be a, a, an educational um, thing that... Uh, uh, for us to, to perform. Right. Um, so it, it, it shows now that we've experienced that, it shows that we don't maybe have enough recreation areas. Um, management is an issue. Uh, even people were, were, I'm not sure, arrested, but they, they were uh, definitely cited. And by entering the national park here, they called them poachers, and they were just trying to go hiking. So, those are the kind that could, that's a contentious issue, in my opinion. That next time this comes around, if it does, you know, we need better uh, management on these resources, and we honestly need more resources uh, for people to to recreate. So, let me explain why I brought this poem up. By reflecting individually on this poem by Robert Frost, as a group, we've, we have collectively explored both the challenges and opportunities to develop an environmental ethic. Okay. So as you plan something like this, you have a, a situation in your, your community, your county, your town, your city. Don't, don't directly go to the issue and people may be thinking you're wasting their time, but tell them that you are using this as something that you can collectively reflect on and discuss. That's where the, that's where the conversation and dialogue can happen. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next. And a lot of people, including some of my family, they'll say, God, I hate poetry. I personally like it. Uh, a lot of people don't, so forgive me. Um, that's uh, not your forte. This is an illustration from a Sand County Almanac um, about it's a it's a skunk. So now I'm going to go into the Sand County Almanac, which has a lot of prose that Leopold wrote. Um, I'll read this to you. Here's some. Here's the activity based on his on his essays. January, the skunk track enters the woods, and this is out of Leopold writing. He's out in the forest. He crosses a glade where the rabbits have packed down the snow with their tracks and molted it with pinkish urinations. Newly exposed oak seedlings have paid for the thaw with their newly barked stems. Tufts of rabbit hair beseek the year's first battles among the armorous bucks. Further on, I find a bloody spot encircled by a wide sweeping arc of owl wing, owl's wings. To this rabbit, the thaw brought freedom from want, but also a reckless abandonment of fear. The owl has reminded him that Lots of spring or no substitute for caution. The skunk track leads on, showing no interest in possible food and no concern of the rompings or retributions of his neighbors. I wonder what he has on his mind, what got him out of bed. 
Can one impute romantic motives to this corpulent fellow dragging his ample belt line through the slush? Finally, the track enters a pile of driftwood and does not emerge. I hear the tinkle of dripping water among the logs, and I fancy the skunk hears it too. I turn homeward, still wondering. So before we go to the left side of the screen on the January thaw, um, let's discuss this. Let's open this up for discussion and, and reflect on Leopold's observation and his reflection on the January thaw on his farm there in Wisconsin. And this is an activity uh, called reading the landscape. And this is what Leopold did a lot of with his students. And he did it for himself. And there's a story, there's, there's multiple stories going on here at a time of year in January. Anybody want to dive into this? Is anybody smelling skunks here recently? Anybody see in sign of skunk in their yard? Any tracks in the snow over Christmas? I haven't seen skunk, but it brought to mind a, um, a hike that we did up on uh, Bad Branch um, a few years back in a deep snow. And a bobcat had gone up the trail. And <clears throat> I don't guess I realized that they marked their territory uh, quite as often as they do. And uh, that's what I was reminded of by this, um, uh, the urinations of the skunk um, marking its territory. And I believe this is mating season for them. Yep. Uh, so uh, anyway, it, it was just interesting to get to see that um, wildlife are not asleep. They're very, very active this time of the year. Right. And even in our part of the country, or yeah, part of the country is even black bears. I can remember seeing fresh snow, uh, fresh prints in snow on the north side of Mount Lecomte in college. It was around 10 degrees and there was a bear out walking around that day. So uh, true hibernation is, is not for uh, many of the, the mammals in our, our part of the world. Now that you mention this, Shad, about freedom, uh, this sentence here on the first paragraph, the owl has, re has reminded him that thoughts of spring are no substitute for caution. Does that resonate with anything that we were just talking about? about people trying to find freedom and and running from fear or running to feet freedom from fear well <clears throat> when i go out it, it's not uncommon for me to come across something that that jolts me back into reality i've come up on a mama bear with her cubs that i i was jogging in the woods and i separated the mama bear from the cubs and one of the cubs went up the tree and um, the mama and the other cubs went to the right and she circled around and got above me. And I sat down within sight of the tree that the cub went up, hoping to catch her coming back for the cub. And she managed to wind me and circle above me and, and come down on me um, and was within 20 yards of me before I ever knew she was there. And I was sitting still in the leaves. So. Mm -hmm. I, I do um, recognize that even as a human, um, we don't uh, have the luxury of just totally disengaging our uh, brains uh, when we're out. We actually have to uh, remember that there's a food chain and we're not removed from it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important of these generations to come because they think that the, the, grocery, the food that they eat comes from the grocery store and they don't have a connection back to the land. 
So what we're finding out is uh, even our generations and younger are not connected to the land. So the Leopold Education Project, its goal is to reconnect people to the land. Otherwise, there's no way to build a land ethic if you don't get people out into the land, whether that's on a, a hunt or a hike or something like that, or else we become even further disconnected to things that sustain us physically and spiritually uh, and even socially. So that environmentally, that becomes uh, a danger of not uh, for future generations. <clears throat> so my point is we've got to figure out how to get people out. And, and that's what the Leopold Education Project and that's what a land ethics leaders is about. Hunters know this, fishermen know this, uh, hikers know this. Uh, and I'll even say, you know, we can even go into motorsports, uh, snowmobilers, ATV, horseback riders. They want places to go. Um, they need the land. And, um, that's something that we uh, have to continue to, to work towards is, is protecting these places, but also opening up more. So here is a little bit of the homework. There's two things to this homework. Um, so we've done some observation by not going outside, but just reading a little bit from a San County Almanac or even Robert Frost. We went on through the woods on a snowy evening. We've been out with Leopold on a hike uh, through on the farm, looking at some uh, wildlife, okay? So what I want you to do and this is, this is a task card. A hibernating skunk curled up in his deep den uncurls himself and ventures forth to prowl the wet world, dragging his belly in the snow. Okay, this is page uh, three. So what I want you to do, you can do it tonight, you can do it tomorrow, you can do it this weekend, but let's do it within the next week. Pretend that you're a skunk ready to den up for winter. Where could you find places to shelter? Apparently... This one went to a pile of driftwood and this farm that Leopold was on was just about five or 600 yards from the edge of the Wisconsin River um, there north of Baraboo. So it had a lot of flooding, so a lot of driftwood. So you need to think like a skunk. The next exercise is, is to take someone with you. That could be a, a, a grandchild, it could be a child, it could be a co-worker, and share this exploration card with them and ask them to do the same. So you're going to deepen your land ethic by thinking like a skunk and find it going out, but also share it with someone else. Can y'all do that? Good, that's great. Already planned it. Very good. The next thing is, how about write a, uh, you could do a haiku. You could do a poem. Or you could do just a narrative like Leopold, or like Leopold has done here. And I want you to send me that. I'd like you to, uh, there's the red phone ringing. Let me get the red phone. Is that Leopold calling in? All right. <clears throat> Another thing is, think about a conservation project. One is to observe, and then your observation has to come from the experience that you, when on your walk, I like a skunk. All right. And then I want you to reflect on that by writing that down and sharing that with the group here on emails within uh, a week from today. That'd be Tuesday 12th, January 12th. I'd like to have some of those written down and sent. The next thing to do is, is you're going to participate in this activity, but also think about, is there, is there a place on your land that you could build a wildlife shelter? 
uh, that you could, you know, basically take some uh, driftwood or you could take some uh, slash from a timber project and make a pile for animals to den in. Do you have that possibility? That's something you could do. Down the, in, the, in the larger picture, what, could, what conservation uh, project could you take as a community, as a, as a land ethic leader in your community that you could do? Do you need to build a mile of greenway? Do you need to do a, build a pocket park? Do you need to make a butterfly garden, a community garden? Is there something that you could work on together as a, as a participation in your community? So that's something larger that you could work on. But for now, let's just think like a skunk, let's find some, some um, wildlife habitat and build some wildlife habitat. So the observe, participate and reflect of the land ethics leader model is based upon Leopold's own method of engaging his family and students. And it provides a framework to help you think about how you approach the challenges in new and open ways in your community, okay? You could use any poem. It could be uh, other poems. It could be something that you write up. It, um, it could be something that someone else wrote, Robert Frost or one of your favorite uh, poets. It could be simply something out of San County Almanac or another uh, environmental hero or heroine in uh, your state. I mean, my gosh, you got what? Who in Kentucky, you got Wendell Berry, right? It could be something, you know, locally there. Not sure about Virginia. But anyway, that's what the Land Ethics Leaders is about, is uh, developing some dialogue and discussion around something that is a little bit off center from the issue at hand. It doesn't even have to be an issue. It can just be together, get together and, and, and have some nature uh, poetry or nature uh, essays, narratives, and have discussions around that so you can all develop your land ethic further and help others on their way and give some uh, participation, observation, and reflection. Any thoughts? Y'all off eating dinner? I just finished. <laughs> you had groundhog, didn't you, Shad? We had fried chicken and corn on the cob from the garden and a salad. A skunk beginning to hibernate would eat the same thing. I'm with you, Shad. <laughs> That's what I have. Um, I do encourage you to go to the Aldo Leopold Foundation website to kind of take a look at that and, and, and read about, you know, hopefully and maybe next fall they'll have a class if you're interested in going that. And then we could even, um, we could take a road trip. We could all take a road trip. How's that sound? Sounds like a plan. Like a plan. So this is kind of how I approach uh, conservation is, 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 is discussion and observation and getting people out and, and doing some type of little project. Doesn't have to be a big project. It'd be some small, so be on your own land. You know, Rob, one thing that I was thinking of during this is uh, several of our master naturalist leadership are, are here tonight and an activity that got canceled this year we were looking at a two day nature journaling workshop. We had a person who was going to come in and, and oh. do classroom in the evening. And then, uh, then we would go out the next day and, and do some actual journaling. I, I definitely see some possibilities for overlapping, um, that activity along with the, uh, the land ethic leader activities and, and getting some, uh, interesting connections through that. Yeah, that that's great. Yeah, this 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 activity would be great with Nature Journal. Bill, I was thinking of the work that Merle has done on the trail, uh, and and some of the stories that he's had from uh, out on the trail encountering 
uh, bear and such, and also the um, the pollinator plots that um, uh, Chris encouraged us to do back in the spring, and um, uh, maybe uh, that's a good idea for something for him to work on um, in the season ahead. Yes. That sounds really good. Does this make, does it, I hope I wasn't too confused. Does this kind of make sense of what you can do in your community and, and how to approach something? It does. Yeah, it's a, it's a definitely interesting to take on how to approach some of those things. And the Leopold Foundation even used a, a group out of Chicago to kind of mo do a model in a, let me see here, it was called, uh, very interesting, the Project on Civic Reflection. And that was a nonprofit out of Chicago and they, they teamed up with them to, to kind of come up with this, this two day training. I can see, it. I think students, you know, younger uh, groups could, uh, could certainly have a fun time with this too. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. We, we, we're, we're not outside to even observe. And if we don't do that, there's no way to reflect. I mean, we're just, we're in front of a screen. I mean, we're in front of a screen right now. I mean, maybe I, I, I'm probably gonna go out and walk around the property tonight and just see what I can see. If nothing else, I definitely want to. I want to smell that wood smoke. That wood smoke should have been in that poem of Robert Frost, with the easy wind and the downy flake. Nothing like cold winter wood smoke smell. I'm feeling it. Yeah. Appreciate y'all uh, joining us, or yeah, joining uh, me tonight. And I need to come up y'all's way, and and uh, I'll get together and have a do a land. I guess what we could do. Just now thinking about it, Phil, we could do a, a Leopold Education Project training where I can train you guys to use the curriculum and do Leopold activities. I yeah, would I greatly appreciate that. That would be fun. Um, maybe we can do that something in the, we did that in the fall didn't we feel we, we did a couple of years this is in 2017 and actually bonnie uh who who hosted us at her cabin uh up on high knob she's on here tonight uh she she logged and uh that yeah we, we had a good time with her. yeah like, we can go back to the cabin phil <clears throat> all right yeah that I, was a I've got, good, a, uh, I got a fire pit now all right. Yeah, that, that might be the, <laughs> the place to think about. Okay. That's something we can think about maybe for the definitely about fall things will be definitely better. But I would I'd be open to do that. And uh, that's something you could not definitely do on uh, Zoom virtually. You'd have to be in person. We did one back in the fall and I had a I had soil and water conservation education coordinators. I had six from the mountain counties here come and we were able to do it in social distancing and everything. Uh, Matt commented, he said, it's going to be hard to get these hunters to ride a haiku. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Hunter haiku. I use one here. We got a haiku. After you hike, you write a haiku about the hike. So we can make one called the haiku hunter. Good deal. <laughs> Uh, Rob, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Uh, uh, good. Uh, good way to start off the year, I think, with this new round of yeah. Mountain Zoom. So thank you again. This is, uh, and I'm sure we'll try to to rope you in to, and take you up on that offer for a, a Leopold project uh, training later on. Yeah, I love to come up, and I love y'all's area, and y'all are just such a great group. I spend more time with you and do something fun. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can y'all can y'all do that? Can you kind of go out and do some observation and 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 can you're a skunk, den up? Um, if you want to send a picture of that, send a picture of that. Share that with the group. Then mm -hmm. write about it, poem, haiku, narrative, and then um, do a little uh, conservation activity, build a little uh, wildlife habitat. Yep. 
Sounds great. Y'all take care. All right. Thanks, Rob. And uh, thank y'all. Coming up Thursday, uh, Jeremy and Shad. Any any comments about what's what's coming up? I think we're uh, going to cover house plants, yes, or at least right. uh, maybe even uh, plants that you have outside that you bring in the house uh, during the winter months. So. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about care and uh, maybe uh, ID some plants, that sort of thing, or talk about what plants to uh, to uh, have for indoor plants. Anything else? That sounds like a great program. And uh, we've got the trapping next week. So we've got Stacy White uh, going to do a talk on uh, trapping. I always like his talks. Yeah, he does does a good job. <clears throat> definitely, definitely. All right. Well, good well, job, thank Rob. You. Thank yeah. you. Good stuff, Rob. Thanks so much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Thank you, Robert. Nice. Appreciate it.